everyone, and uh, welcome to the first of our events, launching the Routledge Handbook of EU Middle East Relations. My name is Dimitris Buris, and I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam. These events are organized by ACES, the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, in cooperation with the Eumenia, Zanmona Network, uh, Institute of Art Internationale, and Roskilde University. They are also supported by the Amsterdam Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the European International Studies Association, the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, Eliamep, and Carnegie Middle East Center. We thank all of them for their cooperation and support. This handbook is a COVID-19 product as we started working on it around April 2019. Some people called us crazy for deciding to embark on such an ambitious task, and maybe we are a little bit, uh, but we are happy to have produced this handbook, which is the first of its kind, aiming to map EU Middle East relations. We are indebted to a number of individuals and institutions, and I would like to take some time to thank all of them. First of all, a big thank you goes to all our authors, almost 60 of them, for all their hard work and patience with us. We couldn't have made this without them, that's for sure. A special thanks also goes to our assistants, Rowan Dunn and Hiner Daniel Freck, without whom this process would have definitely been much more chaotic. A thank you also goes to the European Commission and its Erasmus Plus program, which helped us establish Eumenia as a network on EU Middle East relations. Special thanks also goes to ACES, which provided us with generous grant support for research assistance, and also to the Department of Social Sciences and Business of Roskilde University, and Institute of Art Internationale for also provided financial assistance and support. We're highly indebted to artist Mazen Alfil, who allowed us to use his beautiful art for the cover of our handbook. We're also highly indebted to Natalie Totsi, Maha Yahia for writing the foreword of the book, as well as to Hannah Nasrawi, Federica Mogherini, Sahram Akbarzadeh and Richard Gillespie for endorsing our handbook. Finally, our gratitude goes to all our students, past, present and future, and the numerous discussions held in the classrooms. We dedicate this handbook to them, hoping that it will act as a stepping stone for a better understanding of the EU, the Middle East and the different entanglements. I hope I'm not forgetting Kenyon, uh, and if I have forgotten someone, please accept my apologies. I know that we have time pressure, so I would quickly like to introduce my great co-editors, Daniela Huber and Michelle Pace, who will talk a bit more about entanglements in Middle East relations. And after that, I will also introduce to all of you our contributing authors and speakers for today. Uh, Daniela Huber is head of the Mediterranean and Middle East program of the Institute of Art Internationale. She's also the editor of the International Spectator and adjunct professor at Roma Trey University. Her research interests include IR theories and methodologies, international relations and contemporary politics in the Middle East, as well as EU and US foreign policy towards and their role in conflicts in the Middle East. Her latest book is The International Dimension of the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, a Post-Eurocentric Approach. Moreover, Michelle Pace is Professor in Global Studies at Roskilde University. She is also Associate Fellow at Chatham House Euro Program. Michelle serves as Associate Non-Resident Member of the Middle East Studies Forum at Deakin University as well as member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Center for Advanced Middle Eastern Studies at Lund University, and also at the editorial board of the journal Mediterranean Politics. Her research areas of interest include migration studies, emotions in IR, 
democratization and de-democratization in the Middle East and North Africa and decolonization. Um, thank you all for being with us today. I will try to be a strict chair so that we make sure we have enough time for Q&A. As agreed, each intervention will last for maximum 10 minutes. Let's see if we can do this. Uh, Daniela, the Zoom floor is all yours. Well, thank you so much, Dimitris, and a warm welcome to everyone also from my side. Um, I will introduce very briefly the overall rationale of the book and Michelle will then go more into conceptual pillage, pillars, which set a little bit the context of our discussion today. Now, as we are speaking, uh, the UN General Assembly is voting in an important emergency special session on the Uniting for Peace procedure as, as Russia is leading a war of um, aggression against Ukraine and so violated one of the most fundamental norms of the international rules-based rules order, which is the norm of territorial integrity and political independence as anchored in the UN Charter. And there is now an almost general agreement in Europe that we are at a historical turn and turning point. And this uh, perception of rupture is certainly quite adequate from a European perspective. Now, when we look at commentary, which has emerged from a Middle Eastern perspective in this very moment, so from our colleagues in the Middle East, then we can see that what is highlighted is more of a continuity of instances of the violation of fundamental norms of the international rules based order in this region. So key examples that are mentioned is the war in Syria, also the Iraq war in which the US, supported by some EU member states, violated the UN Charter in 2003. Also highlighted is that since 2015, there are instances in which the EU is violating the principle of non-refoulement vis-a-vis refugees coming from Asia, the Middle East and Africa. Other questions such as Israel-Palestine or Western Sahara are also mentioned a lot in reflections on the situation in Ukraine. So from an EU Middle Eastern lens, we unfortunately actually see a lot of continuity when it comes to violations of a rules-based international order. So why am, am I starting with, with this example? Um, because um, this question of continuities and ruptures uh, from both a European and a Middle Eastern perspective is indeed the question that we have also actually started the handbook with. We asked ourselves if relations between Europe, so the European community, later the European Union and the Middle East have changed substantially. And in particular, how can we understand continuity or ruptures in these relations? Um, so the handbook addresses this general overall problematic from a long durée perspective, uh, offering an equal platform to both Middle Eastern and European viewpoints, as well as to interdisciplinary perspectives that question the manner in which relations between Europe and the Middle East have evolved since the foundation of the European community, in, in particular of the European Union. It does so in various um, dimensions. Indeed, the handbook is in six parts and um, our webinar series is also in these very six parts. So the first part that we are discussing also today is history. Then a uh, second part is theory, a third multilateralism and geopolitics, a fourth is contemporary politics, uh, fifth peace, security and conflict, and finally economics, development and trade. Um, and so while the handbook is conceived of in its larger structure around the gravitational point of historical legacies and continuities, which are evident in these larger themes, the authors of the single chapters have of course adopted their own and different uh, theoretical, conceptual and methodological lenses tailored to the specific topics they are exploring and which we will cover in this series. Um, of webinars. So today it covers the historical part of the book and I will now give the word uh, to Michelle uh, who will highlight uh, conceptual pillars and key ruptures in this history. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. And if I can ask Marie to share the PowerPoint slides, please. So this is the cover of our book, which shows you the painting by Mazen Alfil as well. And if we can go to the second slide, please. And the third slide, thank you. So um, as Daniela mentioned, one of the things that started our quizzing um, in order to prepare for this handbook 
was actually what brings the EU and the Middle East together in the shape of different forms of entanglements. And these, of course, could be social, cultural, economic, political and others. So the, the sort of the three premises upon which we decided to feed into the contributors who very kindly um, address these issues was first and foremost, as Daniela mentioned, that we allowed for both interdisciplinarity, but also transdisciplinarity. So different disciplines also speak to each other throughout the various contributions. And the idea was to attempt as far as possible to recollect the legacies of both Europe and the Middle East, but also of the Middle East in Europe in as an exclusive way and inclusive way that aims to do as much justice as possible to these entanglements and also for students of EU Middle East studies to appreciate these entanglements and as Daniela mentioned as, as a long durée process. Secondly, we attempted to recenter the significance of academic disciplines, but also the importance of our theoretical tool sets for the study of non-European contexts, in this particular case, of course, the Middle East. And thirdly, as I mentioned, an appreciation of all the entanglements that forge this important relationship, entanglements that supersede rigid identity discourses, national, cultural or regional canons, as well as epistemologies. So in the context of also what we've been seeing in the last days with uh, the flow of Ukrainian refugees around our borders, we think it's important, for instance, that the EU debate on migration and refugees is very much entangled in Europe's dismal record on racism, the rise in anti-Muslim sentiment and the continent's complex post-colonial relations with its southern and, of course, African neighbours. So if we now move on to ruptures, so as much as we have entanglements and continuities, we also discover ruptures. But first, uh, what we mean by ruptures are those moments in time when contradictions and paradoxes become particularly evident or when apparently harmonious relations suddenly experience a breach, or when moments of truth emerge in which silences in a discourse are exposed for the underlying interest that they serve. So the first rapture that we identified was the end of the Second World War, when Europe was divided into East and West, and of course the decolonization process in the Middle East started. The second rapture kicks off in 1967 and the end of Pan-Arabism, the 1973 war and as well the oil crisis, but also the creation of the global Mediterranean policy by the EEC then and the Venice Declaration 1980. The third rapture brings us to 1989 and the first US-led invasion in Iraq, the so-called Middle East peace process, as well as the Euro-Mediterranean partnership in 1995 and the ENP in 2003. We continue with the fourth rapture, we move now to the 2000s and the intensification of American and European military presence in the Middle East and North Africa, not least in the Persian Gulf, in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also in regards to Iran, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the so-called War on Terror and the acceleration of Western securitization of the region. The fifth rapture brings us to the 2010-11 so-called Arab uprisings, the rise in political Islam, and as a result of these uprisings, of course, the fear by those, especially in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, as well as Israel, of Iran's uh, power coming more to the fore. So these ruptures continue, as we see, to fuel conflicts in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya, Israel, Palestine. And in all this, we see the EU as failing to adopt any meaningful role in all of these conflicts. So what we see here are raptures as moments of truth and a wake-up call which expose the EU's vulnerabilities but also the fallacies of its pol policy paradigms in the manner so far. So by concluding this introductory session, what we deem as the key contradictions and paradoxes in new Middle East relations leave us with some food for thought for those who will hopefully be reading this handbook and be thinking about the world out there in terms of the contributors' reflections on each of these topics. So we hope that educators and students of both Europe, the EU and the Middle East will appreciate that we need to supersede constructions of what is the Middle East or what is Europe or the EU by immersing ourselves as students and the subjects of the study at hand. So to take that kind of critical positionality and take a step back. 
Secondly, to turn our focus to the key sites of our knowledge production, that is an introspective exploration. So to be conscious of the knowledge that we produce for whom and by whom. And thirdly, we hope that the handbook aims to create a platform, both for teachers and students, that rests upon the idea of what we call learning communities and the principle of research with rather than research on, learning with rather than learning on, and teaching with rather than teaching on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Perfectly on time and perfectly spot on. Um, I'll, I'll now move to giving the floor to, to our speakers, but before doing this, I would like to introduce them properly. I'll start with uh, Sena Medin Dizgit, who is a professor of international relations at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Sabanchi University. She's the co-author of Turkey and the European Union and also the author of Constructions of European Identity. Uh, after Senem, uh, or with Senem, we have Baharu Merlili, who is a professor and Zalman Metzer in the Department of International Relations at Koch University in Istanbul. Her research has focused on international relations theory, processes of European identity construction, conflict resolution, and the interaction between the EU and Turkish politics and civil society. Following that, we have Robert, Roberto Mata who is currently a visiting professor at Northwestern University. He's the author of Jerusalem from the Ottomans to the British and also the editor of Jerusalem in World War I, the Palestine diary of a European consul. He's also the executive editor of the Jerusalem Quarterly and host of the Jerusalem Unplugged podcast. Last but not least, the floor will go to Nora Laffey, who is a historian specializing in the Middle East and North Africa. She's a senior research fellow with the Leibniz Centrum Modern and Orient in Berlin and leader of the Historicity of Democracy in the Arab World research project, which is supported by the Leibniz Gemeinschaft. I'm sorry if my German accent is not, is not great. Uh, thank you all for being with us today. Senem um, and Bahar, the Zoom floor is all yours. Uh, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, and I'd like to start by congratulating the editors for putting together such an impressive handbook, which I imagine was a very demanding task. And also for including a substantial section on history because uh, many volumes about the EU often treat uh, the history as starting with the EU. But what we see is the fact that, you know, the much mentioned break with the past, which supposedly defines European identity, didn't really fully materialize in many member states and also the number non-member states the EU is currently interacting with. And a good example of that is Turkey. And uh, in this volume we have with Senem and also with Joanna, we have had the chance to contribute with a chapter which analyzes uh, the Ottoman Empire's relations with European countries, roughly covering a period starting with late 18th century and finishing with uh, very early 20th century. So obviously uh, the history between Europe and Turkey is complex and multi-layered, but we see that in a lot of contemporary discussions, this complex and multi-layered history is very much reduced to a very singular and reductionist narrative. Uh, it is as if, you know, in Europe, uh, the history with the Turk at large is frozen at the gates of Vienna. Turkey is the historical other of Europe, belonging to a different civilization, therefore has been always in a 
a situation of military confrontation, once mighty and superior has gradually declined to a much weaker state, and now, you know, desires to become a member of the European Union, all of a sudden, kind of. And then when we look at it from the perspective of Turkey, this history is kind of frozen at the end of the First World War in the infamous Treaty of Serb, which didn't materialize, but which kind of had set the stage for the partition of the territories of Turkey by uh, various European powers and reducing Turkey to maybe one fifth of the size that it is today. Uh, what we find very briefly in this uh, analysis, as Sena will explain actually this part, this chapter is part of a much broader project we have conducted where we traced the evolution of identity representations in Turkey and in Europe, uh, again, starting with late 18th century at 20 important critical political or cultural events or turning points. So in this chapter, for example, we point to a number of developments in this complex and multi-layered history, which does not find its way in contemporary narratives on history on the two sides. For example, we uh, focus very much on the uh, Tanzimat period in the Ottoman Empire-Europe relations which coincides with a strong rapprochement between Britain and Ottoman Empire against the shared Russian threat. And this is, for example, a period in which there have been a very strong and positive representations of the Ottomans in Europe as partners and also as belonging broadly to the European civilization. And then, for example, another uh, snapshot I can just talk about from uh, the chapter that we also found in our broader research is the wide variation in how Britain, France, and Germany viewed the Ottomans, and they did so very differently. For example, German representations of Ottoman Empire have often put uh, a premium to the empire's role in maintaining stability and order in a volatile uh, part of Europe. So therefore, uh, German representations of the Ottomans have been much more uh, positive even when, you know, British and French representations of the Ottomans turned negative, criticizing the Ottomans for despotism and also uh, in general for, you know, what are framed to be non-European ways of acting. So I will finish here and then give the word to my colleague, Sena, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank you and also congratulate you, the editors, for this commandable job uh, and a wonderful uh, book. Um, and I'm very happy to be here today and to see all of you. Uh, even virtually, even virtually. Okay, so I will continue from where Bahar has left off. Uh, as she said, I mean, this chapter is also a part of, or at least the data that we've been using for this chapter is also a part of a larger Horizon 2020 project on the future of the EU-Turkey relationship, where me and Bahar, we looked at identity representations on the part of Europe and, and Turkey. And we tried to trace those identity representations from the Ottoman era 
to today, basically, to modern Turkish Republic. And basically what we see now, Bahar mentioned a bit about the, Europe, the changing identity representations on the European side. But what we've also found is that identity representations have been very contested and have changed almost in a cyclical relationship or a cyclical pattern on the Turkish side and the Ottoman side as well. And that's what the long jura analysis has actually shown us. And this was in fact one of the reasons why we wanted to embark on this wider research project, because often you have snapshots of, you know, debates, discussions, you know, studies here and there about how identity matters in the Turkey-Europe relationship, but not really looking deeper into history about how it mattered, where it mattered, and how it was perceived and how it changed. And I will come to that point of change towards the end of my talk, because I think it's extremely important and also politically very relevant given the state that we are in today. Anyhow, I'll leave that now for a minute. So coming back to identity representations on the Turkish side and on the Ottoman side, basically what we've seen is that there has been a shift over time in during the Ottoman era from about 18th century onwards or so, a constant shift and contestation of what Europe means and also what Europe should mean and what European influence should mean for Turkey, Turks and the Ottoman Empire. And I mean, for instance, in the earlier uh, decades or uh, years of empire, Europe is seen as the inferior infidel, right? And there's this huge superi Ottoman superiority that really defines uh, its relationship and its representation uh, of Europe. Uh, but that changes over time. That sense of superiority declines in early 18th century or so, and Ottomans also start and embark on this process of westernization. And so, you know, and this ushers in a lot of debates about what Europe is and how Ottomans should benefit from European influence. For instance, you know, is there a material component to Europe or a spiritual aspect to Europe? Can we think of two different Europes as such? And so can Turks imitate the former, whether reject the latter? Uh, when you look at, for example, the Tanzimat Edict, which was published in 1839, that aim to render state society relations in European, um, in, in the Ottoman Empire, for instance, we see that, there, that this gives rise to a huge contestation of what Europe means and also on European influence. We see a very nuanced debate across the Ottoman elite, bureaucracy, thinkers, intellectuals at the time, ranging from a very positive embrace and representation of what Europe means to a ne very negative one where there is complete rejection. But I, what we'd really like to underline there is the importance, the significance of contestation. Because what we see is that there is never a homogenous understanding of Europe or Turkey, both on the European side and also on the Turkish side. And we see that representations in history have always been subject to political constellations within the empire, within Europe, and also in their relationship with one another. So this for us is something that is of, of huge relevance for today as well. So in other words, of course, this is a handbook also covering or trying to understand the contemporary state of affairs and where we are today, but the significance of history, or at least having history in there is important because of the contemporary relevance that it holds. Or what kind of a contemporary relevance are we really talking about today? Now, two things there, which I think are very, very visible. The first one is what we're witnessing in today's politics is this constant rewriting of history, constant re-representation of history to justify certain political actions. Uh, and this is particularly the case, for instance, uh, in the case of autocrats justifying their actions. It is the case even in the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the war that we're seeing today. A certain reading of history that's trying to be imposed. So there's a huge, I think, contemporary relevance in the sense that history is being used and manipulated by contemporary elites in order to justify certain contested political goals and aims. And in that sense, 
that requires us to take this critical approach to history, which is also what we try to do in this chapter, and thus try to deconstruct that. Now, the second thing I think, which uh, underlines the contemporary relevance of historical research, including, including our contribution, is that what we've seen in our, in, our, in our project is that the seismic geopolitical shifts matter in identity representations. The cycles of conflict and cooperation that has existed in history that we've seen in the Ottoman uh, European relationship or Turkish European relationship has had a huge impact on how both sides perceive each other's identities as the other of each other or as an extension of the self or a liminal etc whatsoever but in that context we've also seen that major geopolitical events also had a huge role you know we can you know take it as back to you know crimean war which also of course involves russia but also things like september 11 events right and these sort of seismic shift making events seem to have a major role in identity representations or the shift and changes in identity representations. And we believe that we might be living through or entering a period in which such geopolitical seismic shifts might be happening. Of course, whether or not they will result in a change or a shift in identity representations um, regarding the Turkish European relationship and identities is an open sort of question and we're going to, I guess, have to have a very long time to see how that figures out. And of course, a lot of, the, of that will depend on other factors in place, but still, I think we are, we think that it's worth uh, watching. So yeah, and I'll close it at that. Thank you, Bahar and Senem. Um, I'll give the floor to Roberto. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, depending where you're located. First of all, thank you for uh, you know, to the editors for putting together this wonderful and very challenging uh, you know, book. And uh, as Michelle mentioned about also teaching, I do use a lot of the uh, Routledge handbook in my teaching, and I hope this one will you know, be added by many uh, scholars because I think they're very useful in terms of providing uh, not just basic information, but also good analytical points that are developed by scholars and they're very focused and very accessible also by students. So I think this is like uh, one of the strengths of these uh, collections and not particularly of this work. Now, let me say a couple of things here. So I'm going to discuss briefly the question of the legacy of British and French colonialism in the MENA region, so Middle East and North Africa. And I also would like to acknowledge my colleague, Sune Hagbole, hopefully I didn't butcher his family name, I'm not really familiar with uh, Danish language, even though I'm passionate about Vikings, but uh, I'm afraid my, my, my linguistic skills are not great uh, with that particular languages. Um, while I covered for the most part the British legacy in the region, uh, Sune has covered the French one, which I will only briefly mention, and perhaps I can develop later in the Q&A session, and maybe um, Nora uh, will, will develop later in, in her contribution. So let me share with you a few thoughts that uh, me and Sune encapsulated and wrote in the chapter before giving some specific example. Uh, when we were thinking about the question of legacy, first of all, we wanted to highlight the fact that when we talk about legacy, we talk about a non-linear connection. In other words, nothing is inevitable and more importantly, nothing is predetermined. So when we look at the legacy, of the British and French rule in the MENA region, we have to think that what they left behind eventually, any time, amalgamated with uh, local, political, social, and economic trends. And uh, they also must be understood in the larger global context. Uh, MENA region often has been excluded from uh, uh, the Cold War, you know, sort of era and Cold War studies, but in different ways, MENA countries were part of the Cold War region, and they too experienced, uh, you know, similar paths, uh, perhaps more indirect than other, you know, Eastern European countries, for instance, or some Latin American or Central American countries. But they are part of that context. So British and French uh, legacy is also to be understood in this broader uh, historical context. 
Now, this is also to say that the legacy of British and French colonial rule does not deny local agents. And this is very important. It's not just to say that like many, they look in sort of a predeterministic way or this idea of a, it's inevitable. And while doing that, uh, these people deny local agency. People keep obviously writing their own history. Obviously that history is influenced and sometimes you know, heavily influenced by the legacy of previous rulers and the institutions or culture that they created and developed in the you know, most specific uh, uh, regions. Uh, now, in this chapter, we, you know, it's a very short chapter, obviously very hard to condense uh, many complex uh, uh, issues together. We really try to look at the remaining impacts of French and British colonialism uh, in light of the current EU, and I, I would say British, you know, uh, obviously Britain is not, uh, is no longer part of the EU, so should be treated differently and separately, but for the sake of the argument, I'm just going to say they're together. Uh, relations, which are we need to be honest, uh, often oblivious of historical context. What we see is often policymakers, politicians, and, uh, you know, officers and officials of the EU often, you know, arguing on and discussing policies, but they often neglect the larger historical context and sort of the deep influence that is rooted within the local context. And again, just to make a clear point, French and British legacy in the MENA region is different in the various different countries. There may be similar trends, but they cannot be read together. And, and I think this is an important uh, element, uh, which I know is be, will be discussed later in, in the coming uh, panels, uh, when you know, people and scholars and colleagues have looked at you know, more contemporary issues. Uh, let me also say uh, that with Sune, we really wanted to include um, a kind of a very controversial statement that was released in 2011 by then uh, British Prime Minister David Cameron, when he suggested that the legacy of the British Empire was and is at the root of many contemporary historical problems. And I think that was like a very important step forward, uh, not just from a politician or a prime minister, but the prime minister of Britain, which Britain often denied some sort of a wrongdoing or detached uh, sort of the, the current generation from the past generation. And, and, and we know that is also part of a, you know, recognizing some sort of wrongdoing in history. Uh, obviously that didn't change anything, but I we thought that it was at least an acknowledgement of the British legacy uh, in, in the Middle East in particular. Now, let me talk about briefly general points of legacy. First of all, since we're talking about colonialism, we thought it was important to highlight the fact that there is no one form of colonialism uh, in the MENA region, but there are several, at least. One in large, you know, large sort of a form, direct control of territories that have then become countries, uh, and also indirect, and, you know, direct tradition is more considered like sort of a French version. So we see direct control over Lebanon and Syria, for instance, uh, of Palestine for the British, but we do have, you know, more indirect form of uh, colonial control. Uh, again, when we look at countries like Jordan in Iraq, um, and uh, we do also have a unique form of colonial control, uh, which is Algeria, because obviously Algeria was considered part of France and it's some sort of a, a unique in, in the MENA region. Um, so, if, you know, we also try to include some uh, theoretical elements. Uh, though we are historians, I always pride myself to say that I come from political science and international relations, and I believe theories are important and should be important for historians, at least to locate uh, and use um, certain concepts in, in historicize those concepts. But let me move, uh, since we talked about the question of ruptures and Mich Michelle mentioned that and I have only a couple of minutes left, um, certainly the turn of a century, but more importantly, the end of World War I is a clear moment of rupture where things change radically in the MENA region. And here I wanna focus briefly on the question of British uh, control of the region. And so, uh, as I said, you know, if you think about 19th century World War I, obviously if we take the example of Egypt, Egypt was occupied by the British in 1882, loosely controlled by the British. They left the monarchy alive, which lasted until 1952. 
but they suddenly set in motion a number of dynamics. And one interesting and very problematic legacy of the British, despite the claim to, uh, you know, this sort of mission civilisatrice of a white man's burden, uh, the British didn't invest much in education. And still, by the 1950s, more than 50% of Egyptians were illiterate. So you have a claim, but then historically speaking, that claim was never fulfilled. So there was no real investment in education. And similarly, we see uh, the, the same pattern in Iraq. But Iraq is also a very different kind of uh, British legacy that to discuss, which is the question of uh, nation building and borders. Uh, we certainly heard, and, you know, we, we, what we scholars, we knew about that, but if you remember ISIS a few years back, uh, when they sort of demolished the borders between Syria and Iraq and mentioning the famous or infamous sykes pico agreement, all of a sudden people remember that actually both countries, particularly Iraq, did not exist before World War I. We have three Ottoman provinces, Mosul, Basra, and Baghdad, which the British brought together mostly for financial reasons uh, and eventually created sort of a new identity, uh, which, you know, we're still dealing today with that and sort of a, you know, particular issue, particularly the Kurdish issue, which is a separated identity and the British disregarded to uh, at the very moment of the creation of, of Iraq. So borders, and again, lack of education. And in the question of Iraq, also the question of the Iraqi army and the use of the REF, so using the air, air power in order to control the country. And in a sense, also leaving the legacy of uh, uh, bombardments of civilians, something that we are becoming familiar once again in the 21st century. Uh, again, as a result of leaving a small amount of troops, but you know, having air power in order to control civilian population. Uh, and I'd be very happy to go on again with, with other form of legacies left here uh, by, by the British. Uh, let me talk about briefly Palestine, because again, that's probably one of the uh, sort of areas where the, the British left a, a very consistent uh, legacy. Uh, Palestine was controlled directly by the British between 1920 and 1948. And again, when we talk about uh, legacy here, we're talking about, for the most part, borders. Palestine did exist before but not in these borders. And, you know, the borders followed, for the most part, biblical archaeology, uh, which is, you know, sort of a British development. But that's not enough. Obviously, we are aware of the fact that the British issued the Balfour Declaration, and that's part of the legacy. Now, the Balfour Declaration itself is a promise. The, the real legacy, as we sort of uh, exchanging ideas between myself and Suna, really comes up with the question of civil, political, and religious rights. The British promised the three of them to one group, the Zionists, but only civil and religious rights to the Palestinians. So the legacy then becomes a reality, and it's, once it's embedded into the British mandate, it's 100 years uh, this year from the uh, establishment uh, of, of the mandates in the region, obviously of the British mandate in, in, for Palestine. And, you know, that became a legal reality. And that also triggered, you know, the... Uh, two different paths. Again, history is, is not inevitable. And uh, what the British did was to create a context into which different actors developed their own agency. Uh, they also left a, a long lasting legacy of uh, uh, policing tactics for those of uh, you in the audience interested in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, Israeli policing is very much based on uh, British uh, policing tactics. Uh, you know, from the demolition of houses or the use of prisoners, you know, put in front of a certain convoy so that they wouldn't be attacked and so forth. And there's plenty, not to mention the, the police uh, stations themselves, which are built by the British, uh, in fact, by an Irishman, uh, you know, connecting to a sort of imperial context. Obviously, also the division of the economic system uh, into one, you know, led by the Zionists and another one for Palestinians which also similar in a sense of what we saw in, uh, in Iraq, which is another important legacy about the oil economy. Uh, we, the oil economy favored small groups of elites in Iraq and obviously Western Europeans who invested in the region, but not the large uh, section of the populations. Um, as I said, I'm not really going to delve into the question of uh, French uh, legacy, but suffice to say that obviously, you know, that. Uh, you know, we have legacies uh, certainly in the political system of Lebanon, 
uh, but also in the one of Syria, which brought to power minorities, and minorities are still in power uh, in Syria 100 years later, uh, you know, after the establishment of the British mandate. And, and so we have, you know, French legacies uh, developing through Morocco, Tunisia, and certainly Algeria. Uh, pity we couldn't really look into Libya, but that would have involved uh, uh, the Italians, which is another chapter uh, perhaps that needs to be looked at and uh, look at the Italian legacy uh, in Libya uh, in terms of uh, social political uh, legacies left uh, in the area and also memory, which is something we didn't cover. And I just and take this uh, last point. You know, there's also a question of uh, legacy in the uh, cultural heritage and in the memory. Now, how people, uh, you know, in time came across, you know, the French and British rule and how they envisioned that and how they understood. So, uh, you know, we know that uh, obviously there is a sense of a negative approach towards Britain and France in many ways, but also, you know, there is a, there is a sense of legacy of uh, connections. It sometimes is only, uh, you know, through knowledge of the language, through, you know, institution building, uh, but it's something that we, we we couldn't really cover in the chapter, but I'm sure that uh, it will it probably touched upon other chapters. One last point, um, which has to do again something we didn't develop, but uh, I, I exchanged a couple of messages with Sune. Um, we saw in the last few days uh, what's happening in Ukraine and the very fact that uh, um, black and brown people trying to leave Ukraine were not allowed into trains. Uh, suggesting form of racism, and I, I, would, I would use the word Orientalism here, shows this kind of relationship between Europe and the Middle East based upon stereotypes, based upon, um, you know, visions and understanding of the other, which does, they're not only in, in Britain and France and Italy, but they obviously pervaded Europe in this large understanding between one and the other. And uh, that reminds me how these perceptions have been formed you know, for the 8th, 19th century, and then pervaded European culture. And they're still very much, uh, you know, part of who we are as Europeans, uh, whether we like it or not. And then when time comes to recognize the other, then these distinctions become very visible. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Roberto. Nora, you're last, but definitely not least. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for. Uh, give me this chance to say hello first to friends and colleagues and to share one part of my research. So my aim um, in this chapter is, um, well, first of all, to address the question of archives and the history for students and for the future students as well, because this uh, um, part of the world is a full, full of archives and uh, we need students to work in history with archives, inedite archives. So my aim is in this book was to discuss the nature of the anti-colonial movements of the Middle East in the context of each historical phase during which they developed. I also wanted, of course, to use the mirror of anti-colonialism in order to better understand, define, and track the logics of colonialism. Another important aim for me was to focus on civil society. I'm presently heading a research program on the local roots of deliberation, mediation, negotiation, and consensus building in the region, with also reflections on uh, local roots of um, uh, this deliberation, and it's a way to uh, examine possible local roots of democratic functioning outside of only European influence, which in fact, as the research show, have often been destructive for such impulses. And of course, this chapter was part for me of these explorations. I try in this chapter to carry out the endeavor in order to unearth the roots, vectors of mobilization, ideological fundaments, and the methods of action of anti-colonial movements. It also serves to analyze political, rhetorical, and sociological continuities and ruptures, as well as to explore ambiguities in relations between anti-colonial movements 
state building processes, civil society, and the outside world. For the preparation of the chapter, I worked on uh, various uh, archival sources and tried to gather an extensive review of the existing literature, which, well, with each time the intent of a critical reading of possible ideological biases. I chose to focus on a series of movements in history, the analyze of uh, which allows me to build interpretative typologies. The first of these episodes uh, is, um, well, I chose this one, but I could choose another one, is uh, uh, 1798, 1801, the urban resistance against the French and British occupation of Egypt, Gaza, and Syria. I followed in local chronicles and archives how networks of mobilization developed according to the lines of structuration of older not networks of local civil society. I mean, guilds, local urban municipal councils, neighborhood solidarity. This was for me in the chapter, a way of insisting on the existence and substance in societies of the region, Middle East, as we call today, of such instances, not just spontaneous or informal, but also structured at the local level within civil society. These networks were mobilized in the context of the resistance against colonial occupation and its brutality. Another focus uh, in the chapter is on Ottoman and local responses to European efforts at colonizing Ottoman provinces in the 19th century. Here again, I tracked in the archives not only reactions at the imperial state level against colonization efforts, but also local networks. And I used petitions by inhabitants networks of solidarity and mutual help. I used the archival traces of such networks in order to reflect on the very nature of these movements, on how they were both anchored in societies and expressing fundamental values of such societies. I applied, I applied this method to the example of Algeria and Tunisia mostly. Here again, I insist, it's not informal. It is the core structuration of society with old regime institutions like municipalities and guilds, and their reformed and modernized version, versions using their social and anthropological basis. Syrian and Iraqi resistance against the colonial interpretation by France and Great Britain, like Roberto said as well, on the League of Nations main mandate, 1920s, was another focus. I spent a lot of time in the archives of League in uh, Geneva and was struck by the similarities and similarity of the petitions sent against colonial occupation. They were expressing even in the time when the institution were not existing anymore. The same capacity in tragic times of occupation and repression to mobilize. I try to analyze the nature of these movements and relationship with other kinds of anti-colonial movements, political parties, resistance movement, and so on. I also track to the continuity and ruptures in this evolution. That's how I came to focus as well on the anti-colonial dimension of the emergence of national movements in the Middle East region old network, new networks, new ideologies, and all the dimensions in between. I conclude the chapter with consideration on the anti-colonial rhetoric and mobilization channels of contemporary insurgencies. I also try to propose long durée perspective on anti-colonial voices. I touched these contemporary dimensions for me, uh, an historian, through the lens of question, I think, uh, to be posed and uh, history imposes us to pose in order to avoid reification and civilizational dichotomies and cliches. 
For me, the roots of anti-colonial movements in the region are within society and its own capacity to organize, express griefs and protests. Overall, for me, the longer durée perspective on the basis of a precise archival research was thus a way to discuss the present, the persistence of interpretative, interpretative cliches, also which are transmitted through chronologies that don't take uh, at all the local and micro dimensions into consideration. This is not to diminish the role of ideologies and macro factors, just to give, an, just to give them roots. What I insist, on the uh, what I insist, sorry, is the capacity of local society societies to mobilize according to networks of which a research posture in historical anthropology helps reveal the civic nature and insist on you know, the civic nature. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nora. Um, and thanks everyone for sticking to, to the time limitations. I think you all did, did great and this allow us for a good half an hour of Q&A. Some questions have started coming already. Uh, please use the, the chat or the Q&A box to pose your questions and I will, I will ask them to, to the participants. I'll start with, with a question which came from Mahir Hamoud. Um, and it's, I think it's quite an open question. Uh, it's directed towards the editors, but also the authors. It's a little bit longer, but I think it's worth reading it. How deep in history the book goes in defining the European identity in relation to the other? For example, the scholastics had a, tr a strong influence from the 1100 to 1700 in saving Europe's and by default today's EU identity in a reductionist fashion, which entails significant barbarization of the other in the European public knowledge. And in this case, the other was mostly the states in the south and east of the Mediterranean. Uh, the great gap of Joseph Schumpeter coined in the early 20th century, which significantly helped in claiming that there was almost no production of thought in the MENA region, among other regions, which in a way cemented the sense of superiority by uh, European regions and intellectuals against peoples in the MENA. So the question is, where is the position of these scholastics in shaping today's relations between the EU and the MENA in this handbook? Um, and there is another question as well from, from our colleague, Beste Ischlegen, uh, which is directed to Bahar and Senem. Um, Beste says, you found that Ottoman narratives changed in the 18th century, in that Europeans who were previously seen as inferior uh, came to be portrayed as superior. Can you please elaborate on this shift? What are the main elements of this narrative constructing Europe as superior? Uh, and I think I'll leave it here. Keep on sending us your questions and we will make sure that they will be responded. Um, I don't know who wants to try and respond to the, fir to the first question first. See Daniela. I can try, yes. Um, I mean, uh, let's say in the book, we, we didn't define that, um, but um, I, I have edited together with Lorenzo Carmen another book, um, which is about decolonizing knowledge on Euro Mediterranean relations. And maybe I can take my answer <clears throat> a little bit uh, more from there. Um, first of all, I think that um, the, 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 the forging of a European um, identity um, ne doesn't necessarily actually come from, from Europe to start with. For example, there is research by, um, by an historian who is at the Freie University of Berlin who has shown that, um, for example, scholar, it, it, scholars in Asia already spoke about the concept of Europe uh, as a political entity before Europeans started to speak about themselves um, in this way. Because let's say how a European identity um, 
was forged that led to how the identity exists of today, I think that comes with, with the European project um, and has evolved over time. Now, of course, I think what you're also referring to is, is um, this kind of, of Orientalism of how Europeans have related to, to the other, yes? And so here, I think that we need um, to, to start in modernity. Um, and how this also overlapped with uh, with a colonial time period, yes? And I think, I mean, I, I'm probably not the expert to speak about that. I think, Nora, you will have much more to say about this. I can say from looking at, at German philosophers that we find this kind of othering uh, in Immanuel Kant, yeah, who set up racial hierarchies. We find it in, in Hegel's book. So, um, well, I, I mean, in the book, we do not set a time frame for this but maybe Nora you you want to add something onto this well I'm um, I would say that uh, the concept of identity or identities of uh, Europe is a very very uh, problematic I think that um, uh, it depends on how we look Europe because Ottoman Empire was a European empire too and uh, I think there is a misunderstanding of uh, this uh, uh, construction. And this is why in my chapter, I try to deconstruct. And uh, indeed, like you said, uh, Lorenzo Camel with this uh, decolonizing knowledge is a part of this uh, deconstruction of uh, this uh, so-called identity of Europe. Because for Ottomanists, for example, like uh, the other colleagues said, you know, um, Ottoman Empire was most European than uh, um, other Asian uh, uh, or African, although it was African. And identities, there was not just one identity, but identities. And it's very, very problematic to talk about um, uh, European identity. And this construction is a part of uh, an ideology. And this ideology is uh, to be deconstructed as well, because uh, in the 20th century, it was constructed along the line of uh, ethnicity and um, sometimes with religion. So I think uh, we have to be very precise to approach and talk about uh, identity of Europe or identities. And uh, to deconstruct that, just looking for other empires. And um, I think the history of Ottoman Empire is uh, very teaching for that. Thank you, Daniela and Nora. I don't know if anyone else wants to chip in with regard to this question or if we should move to the second one. I don't see anyone. So I'll go to, to Bahar and Senem for the question uh, about the Ottoman narratives. Shall I? start? Okay, yeah. I, I don't know if there are any others. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, all right. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, Bester, for your question. It's very nice to hear from you as well, uh, even though it's in this format, it has to be limited to this, but anyway. Uh, now, about the sense of superiority, what we had seen is that it starts off initially as a in, as acknowledging Western military and technological strength, right, um, in early 18th century. So, and with it comes an increasing interest uh, in the Ottoman Empire towards Europe. So, you know, constantly diplomatic representations begin to be open. There's a lot of interaction increasing between the two sides, etc. So that goes hand in hand. But how that sense of superiority, you know, you know, that is attributed to Europe plays out changes um, in the following decades and periods. For instance, if we look at the Tanzimat period, you know, Tanzimat period of, again, you know, that, that's what I refer to in my speech as well. It's a very key period in Turkish history, Ottoman history, in understanding the complexity of the debates on Europe. Um, in the history of Turkey, that also has implications on the way in which Europe is debated today in Turkey as well. So that's why we would like to underline the significance of that period. During this period, you see various different, I would say, and sometimes competing uh, versions of how and why Europe is superior. 
For some, Europe denotes a civilization of peace, prosperity, liberty, etc., and which really exists in the Islamic civilization as well, but has somehow been lost. For others, Europe is associated more with knowledge and learning and whatever, and that's something that needs to be repeated or not. But basically, there you also see a division that exists, which in my opinion exists today as well, not just in Turkish discourse, but European discourse too. And we mentioned also in the chapter that we cannot think of these identity representations as existing completely separate from each other and without interacting on one another, this division between, you know, civilization as something that can be achieved by doing the right things, like, for instance, you know, respecting liberties, et cetera, advancing in technology, adopting certain values and implementing in their own principle, or something that is inherent to Europe itself. And we see that in particular uh, in the debates of the Young Turks which uh, were very critical of the Ottoman Sultan and his arbitrary rule, and that were also an important group because it was an important cadre uh, from within which, you know, the founding elites or the founding um, individuals of the modern Turkish Republic also, some of them at least, emerged. So, uh, so you see that kind of, so it's not a simple way of who is superior or inferior, but basically around the concepts on which superiority is built and whether or not, you know, a, a country like Turkey or Ottoman Empire can catch up with that or not, or should catch up with it or not. Maybe Mahar would like to add something. Yes, thank you. I mean, basically, I'd like to echo what you just said, that it, this wasn't kind of a wholesale superiority. Uh, at the time, the notion of civilization that, you know, the Ottomans embraced was kind of a universal civilization that Europe is a part of and that, you know, the Ottomans are also on their way to join. So the world wasn't kind of seen as divided into incompatible and competing civilizations, but one civilization that can, as you, as Senam just mentioned, you know, can be acquired. And also there was always this tension that, you know, is in seeing Europe as superior in some respects, but inferior in others. For example, superior in technology, but inferior in culture, in morals. So this is, I think, an important part of, of course, also identity formation and pursuit of self-esteem. That, you know, in this relationship between Ottomans and Europe, uh, if you accord, you know, wholesale superiority, to the other, then there wouldn't be a means for you to seek, uh, you know, and attain self-esteem. So therefore, uh, in Ottoman thinkers, intellectuals, those who interacted with Europe at the time, there was always this kind of a dual approach as Europe superior in some respects, but inferior in others. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Bahar. Uh, we do have time for, for a couple more questions. Uh, there is also the option for people to unmute themselves and ask the question uh, directly if, if you wish so, or else please continue using the chat box and the QA box uh, to pose your questions. Daniela, I think you had Yes, uh, I had another question, but I see that there is one question uh, in the audience. Maybe someone, I, because I'm not host, can open the mic. Yes, okay. Uh, we can hear uh, you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentations. Uh, it was very helpful. And... Uh, I am also excited to uh, read the uh, book as a whole. Uh, 
My question is for Professors uh, Rumeli and Aydin Duzgit. Uh, as, far, as far as I recall, uh, Professor Rumeli has predominantly preferred uh, constructivism in her work, while uh, Professor Aydin Duzgit has uh, mostly employed post-structuralism in uh, her previous work, such as the constructions of uh, European identity. Uh, so I wonder how have uh, they reconciled their theoretical perspectives in this project, uh, whether they have preferred constructivism or post-structuralism or some, something else, some, something in between or something different uh, as their uh, theoretical framework. And in relation to this point, um, how would you situate how, how would they situate the role of power uh, uh, in this project? Uh, so there's uh, emphasis on the in, uh, role of interaction and mutual identity representations, but what shall we make of the asymmetry of power between the Ottoman Empire and Europe in this interaction? So how was the Ottoman representations of Europe distinct, distinct from uh, the European representations of the Turk or the Ottoman Empire in terms of their influence of shaping discourse and or events. I wonder. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bahar and Sanam, who would like, I, I see okay. Bahar. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, question. Uh, I'll start with the uh, second part because I think that is kind of uh, more relevant and touching on an important point. Uh, because, you know, we cannot, uh, of course, overlook the changing uh, power dynamics between Ottoman Empire and Europe uh, during the time that we're looking at. Uh, in the way, I mean, it's possible to think of various ways in which uh, power operates. Material power differences are never by themselves sufficient to totally change or shape identity discussions. But uh, this doesn't mean that, you know, power isn't also projected through discourse through dominant meanings and, you know, different sides in a relationship may have differential capacities to actually shape these dominant meanings within which the discussion takes place. So one way in which, you know, this power asymmetry, I think, between Europe and the Ottoman Empire plays out in the discursive terrain is through the formation of concepts. For example, the concept of civilization itself, you know, is uh, foreign to the Ottoman vocabulary. At first, you know, it is sought to be translated with various other synonyms uh, which are present in the Ottoman language. But later on, you know, the word civilization is adopted and used. So the concepts by which, through which, you know, um, Ottomans seek to situate themselves in relation to Europe tend to be defined and conceived in Europe and that creates kind of an asymmetry. A second factor I we have noticed, I think, in this that, you know, we talk about this, you know, interact ideological process of identity formation. But, uh, you know, such that European representations of the Ottomans resonate in the Ottoman Empire and shape how they, you know, represent Europe in turn. So that creates kind of a cyclical di dynamic. Negative representations trigger more negativity, positive representations trigger more positivity in terms of the cyclical relationship. But Ottomans are generally on the reactive end. I mean, it is when, you know, uh, a more positive representation of the Ottomans 
originate in Europe that, you know, the Ottomans reciprocate with more positive representations of Europe. But the dynamic we haven't really seen as being one, you know, originating in Turkey, the cyclical dynamic. Uh, that's all I can say uh, for the time being. Thank you for the question. Sena, would you like to add or maybe challenge yeah. what I said? Please go yeah, ahead. No, no, I'm not challenging it. I agree with you. <laughs> I don't want to repeat what you said, but maybe just add something. Um, with regard to the first question about our theoretical approach. Now, I think for the purposes of our project and for the chapter as well, um, since what we were aiming to study was the identity representations, I don't see a major difference um, between the sort of constructivist and more sort of reflectivist or radical constructivist or whatever you name it, perspectives approach to identity in the sense that we, I mean, both of them conceptualize identity as relational, both of them conceptualize identity as discursive. And we're looking at this issue from a relational perspective and also a discursive perspective. So I would, I'm not sure about if we'd agree, but I would say that we adhere to a broader constructivist outlook of identity, uh, which was also useful in clarifying our methodology and our approach, the approach that we took to this project. So that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I can't see any questions. I hope it's a little bit difficult to look at everything, I can't see anything, but if there are any questions, please feel free to, to directly unmute yourself and ask the question or else I think Daniela wanted to ask something. Yes, very briefly to, to both uh, Roberto and Nora actually. Um, because there is this new phase which you, Roberto, kind of mentioned in, in European memory politics in a way that suddenly politicians may that be in France, in the UK, also in Germany, not so much in Italy, I have to say, are suddenly beginning to refer to the colonial history of the respective states, but in a very superficial manner. And, and particularly connecting to what Nora said, they don't want to connect to civil society. For example, in, in Namibia, yeah, there was the case that the German government didn't even consider to speak um, to, to civil society in the country and what they had. And, and to um, particularly also to, to those people who had suffered most um, under the German colonial period. So, it is a very, it's a new phase. Somehow they have opened this up, but don't really follow up. So I wanted to have an interpretation from both of you what, what this means, this new kind of politics. How comes this, this happens now and, and the way it happens? Thanks. Nora, do you want to go first? Yeah, I, I can go first if you want, Roberto. Uh, so my um, first of all, I would uh, I would say that uh, there there are roots on this uh, question. Um, as I said in the chapter, uh, there is um, um, a way to see a society uh, like um, um, non-civic because it helps to control the society. So, for example, uh, precisely because I work on the archives uh, in different empires and specifically the Ottoman Empire, there was a civil society and uh, embodied uh, by uh, materiality and uh, this, uh, these different institutions and uh, the writing of petitions by women, by different groups of uh, guilds. Uh, it's not just as we see today, you know, the Christians, the Jews, the Muslim. It could be a, a very um, important group with different religions or with different uh, uh, sects. And I think it's very important to look at the roots of this uh, uh, civil society with institutions. And these uh, uh, institutions reflect the, the ways a society were organized. And um, 
in the 19th century with this uh, uh, colonization and the wish to control societies, uh, there was a, um, a very constructing um, way to deny this uh, uh, civic aspect. And I think it's very important to see that. And uh, um, it, it was during the time of uh, Ottoman Empire, of course, because when it colonized uh, the provincial Algeria, for example, or Egypt or Palestine. So we can see that, but we can see that as well. And it's very important in the moment of the construction of uh, European institutions. And uh, for example, if you go to the, 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 the archives of the League of Nations uh, and you look at these uh, petitions, they didn't have a bureau, an office, to hear the petition of the populations. So they just reject these uh, uh, petitions. And uh, there was uh, just uh, two countries in the League of Nations, they were uh, Haiti and Brazil, who protested the, the way to uh, reject petitions from a civil society. And I think it's very important for uh, deconstructing this uh, notion that uh, Europe was constructed with the uh, world constructed by this uh, democratic aspect and but at the beginning of uh, Europe and this institution there was uh, no possibility to uh, petition and say no uh, we are uh, bombarded we are um, uh, we contest and there was no possibility for civil society to contest to contest this um, uh, bombardments or this uh, uh, violation of human rights. And I think this is the core as well of the construction of uh, Europe as well. So I think we have to think about this office and this way to think about Europe and the way to think about the civil society. And uh, the two main countries in the League of Nations was France and Great Britain, and they denied the way to uh, answer to the civil society. And I think, I think this it's the, um, the core of uh, why there is uh, um, uh, this uh, way to think um, this society without uh, uh, civic institutions or uh, even a conscience of uh, these uh, civic identities and bodies. So Roberto, I think you want to add uh, concerning Palestine perhaps, but it was the same for Palestine. So they wanted to, they created minorities that it did not exist before. And I think it's a part of, uh, it's an answer as well. These uh, minorities did not exist as a concept. And it was the core as well of this uh, denying uh, the existence of multiple identities, communal identities, religious identities, and so on. And um, perhaps I stop here, otherwise, <laughs> I, but I can be longer if you want. I just, I just think that Daniela's question is, is very important and uh, certainly fitting the question of EU-MENA relations. Um, in, particularly when we look at the question of colonialism and understanding, uh, I think the question is that what do we really know as European citizens of uh, European colonialism uh, other than what we learn in school, which in general is very superficial. And so when we look at statements like Dave Cameron, you know, that was somehow shocking in a way. Uh, but I, I, I think the previous one by uh, famously by uh, King Leopold of Belgium, when he apologized for the massacres that occurred, I mean, up to a point, but there was some sort of an opening. Uh, that opening, however, I believe is uh, non-organized and is uh, upon the individuals. Um, Theresa May, uh, as a prime minister of Great Britain, did, did not certainly apologize for the Balfour Declaration. Uh, I was, you know, for the centennial of the Balfour Declaration, I was in Palestine. In, quite interestingly, in an event organized by the uh, British consulate in Jerusalem, uh, in, of Palestinian organizations, sort of reflecting on the centennial where the uh, British embassy in uh, Tel Aviv organized a celebration of the very same document on the very same day. So I, I like in the contradictions and, and of course, you know, uh, Theresa May said, I'm not going to apologize for that, taking pride of uh, 
the Balfour Declaration as some sort of a, a you know, saving documents for, for the Jewish people in Europe. I, I have questions about that, but showing the question of, uh, you know, inconsistencies. And as you mentioned, you know, you know the Germans, uh, you know, their responsibilities in, uh, in Africa, not to mention the Italians in Libya. I, I, you know, some of us are familiar with the Italian context. I never knew anything about the Italians in Libya because they're not taught in uh, schools up until I moved to London when I was at SOAS 20 years ago. And uh, I still remember the professor of Ottoman history, Benjamin Forna, talking about the Italians in Libya. I'm like, sorry, I don't know anything. And I'm Italian. So uh, again, I don't see this as a, an organized attempt to correct history or to take responsibility. It's a more relative individual basis. On the other hand, picking up from Nora's uh, answer, there is a grassroots movement. Civil society is reacting. And I think this is due to different uh, causes. Um, migration, the fact that, uh, you know, on the streets you deal with people that are different from you. And while some, they may turn to populism or right-wing ideologies, others are more interested in understanding, okay, why are you here? You know, what are the points that are bringing us together? And many are surprised that, well, you know, uh, France used to rule Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, and I'm here. And the same is, uh, you know, for, I don't know, Ethiopians in, in Italy, or all, all obviously the various ethnicities that live in around Great Britain uh, connected through the British Empire and so forth. And, and, and I think that's changing the attitude. I mean, what we saw, uh, particularly following, you know, the events in America, Black Lives Matter, you know, these ideas of cancel culture that brought to, you know, these movements across Europe really sort of uh, ignited the debate, which is not an easy one. And we probably all witnessed a lot of politicians from the left to the right, not really understanding what was going on. And I think we too, as scholars, you know, we're still dealing with the understanding, but I think Nora is right. I mean, civil society is central and should be central in this debate. Mm. I'll stop. But maybe can I add something concerning the decolonizing knowledge, I think, uh, we are in the in the 21st century and we have a different way to address this uh, question and uh, some countries are very very um, problematic uh, for example uh, I would I want to, to to mention that France wanted in uh, 2015 uh, obliged professors and scholars to teach that colonialism is positive, and it was voted in the. Well, they they talked about in about it in the uh, Assemblée Nationale, and uh, then uh, there was a petition by historian French historians, and uh, uh, it was not accepted this uh, law. But uh, this it's a way that uh, uh, there is a, a sort of a construction of identity based on. Uh, uh, history constructed on false events and false ideologies. And uh, this ideologies was saying that colonialism is positive because there is this idea, and this is what they wanted to teach in France to the old children and uh, even at the university. And I think uh, this is a part of this uh, uh, legacy of controlling uh, and this controlling is a part of this uh, uh, colonialism, and I this we have to discuss this uh, uh, way to think a society and to rule a society, even in Europe. And I think it's very very important, uh, and uh, we have to uh, to look at all of this uh, way to uh, to teach history and why history matters for European and how to teach it. And I think it's very, very important. I think that's, that's a great conclusion, Nora, and a very, very good thing for everyone to keep in mind, actually, uh, and for all of us to reflect upon as well, because I think it's, it's super important and super interesting. I'll draw this, this session to, to a close. I would like to thank everyone who joined us from all over the world uh, for, for this celebratory moment of launching this handbook. A big thanks to, to all of our speakers and contributing authors 
who made some time to be with us uh, today. Our next event is in two weeks. I've put in the chat the link for, for all the next couple of events. Our next one is in two weeks, same, same day and time. Um, and last but not least, I would also like to say a big thank you to Marie Coffey and Deborah Del Piano for working behind the scenes so that we can all launch this series uh, and organize this, this series. Uh, thank you all. Uh, stay safe and well. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you. Thank you.